All right, welcome everybody. I have 445, so I'm going to get started. Hopefully you'll get started with me. Uh, so welcome everybody. I believe that this will be the uh, least predictable session of the week. Um, but uh, we've done this a few times at, at some of the other workshops where I've just sat down with a, a few people and talked about random things. Uh, they've heard some of the questions, but perhaps not all the questions, so that it won't be scripted. Um, what I'm going to do is, is we'll go through some brief introductions, I have some questions, and then I'm going to open it up at some point for some of you to ask questions. Uh, <laughs> perhaps not all of you. Um, and then we'll do a lightning round, and then we'll wrap some things up and, and get to the festivities for tonight. So um, I'm going to ask each of you just to sort of introduce yourselves briefly, um, sort of how you connected with VM, and, and we'll come back to some other questions. So uh, we'll start with you, Mark. Uh, I'm Mark Cathcart, uh, British by uh, birth, American by citizenship. Um, I guess I worked on VM from 1976 as an operator through till, I guess, probably 93. Um, in various guises, I made, uh, after a lot of effort, I made Distinguished Engineer at IBM. I was provided the original ideas for the design of the scalable Java VM virtual machine um, and a bunch of other things. I'm basically a jack of all trades and master of none. <laughs> you wouldn't want me writing code for you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gabe Goldberg. Uh, my second job was at the MITRE Corporation in uh, Virginia. And in 1972, somebody at MITRE made the very wise decision to convert from OS 360 to VM370. And so I installed VM370, release one PLC9, and I've been along for the whole 50 year ride. And I don't know who that person was. I don't know how that decision got made. And I don't even remember how I felt about it, that the system that I had worked on at IBM, I worked in Poughkeepsie, for three years before going to Washington. And so I'd been in OS 360 development, and here somebody had decided that I was gonna do something different. Uh, but it looked like it was exciting, it looked like an opportunity to get on, get in on the ground floor, uh, and it was just great. I stayed at MITRE until 1985, joined VM Systems Group, uh, the other VM company that was started in 1980. VM Systems Group, as opposed to VM Software, uh, it was very confusing because both companies, one was VMSG, the other was VMSI, were both in Northern Virginia, and they had we had adjacent telephone directory <laughs> listings. And so there were a great many funny missed calls, one wanting the other, and there were even funny random missed shipments. Uh, VMSG, where I was, once got a giant box of coffee mugs uh, that had been ordered for the other company. And fortunately, we were all on good terms, and I had friends at the other company, and so I was able to call them and say, I think we have something that's yours. But they also got calls from us, so we, we helped each other out. Stayed at VMSG until 92 or so, switched to being a freelance writer, editor, consultant, um, and suddenly it's 2022. How did that happen? Mm. Well, my name's Chuck Morse. Um, I joined IBM in 1966 um, as a systems engineer in a branch office in Detroit. Um, I was there when VM was announced in uh, 1972. I didn't get a chance to work on it until um, early 1973 at one project. I, I too was, was destined to be a uh, large systems OS guy at that time. Um, but I had one project, and by June of 1973, I had um, told my management I wanted to do something else. There was a job opening in the regional data center that wanted a VM system, and that's what I wanted, and that's the job I got. Um, so I was in uh, the Great Lakes Region uh, data center and field support for a number of years. Um, I, my first job was running a VM system, but in that job, I was probably the only person in the region who could intelligently talk to a customer about VM and 
give them a demo right afterwards. So I, we had a machine uh, right there. And, and so that was uh, a lot of what I did during that period of time, and I enjoyed that very much. Um, in 1977, I, I decided I wanted to expand my uh, horizons a bit and join a national technical support organization. Uh, and so I, um, I was looking at the Poughkeepsie System Center is where I wanted to be. Only the Poughkeepsie System Center was looking to move to Gaithersburg. And um, so by the time I got an opportunity, the, uh, uh, all the large systems um, guys in, um, and, and well, large systems, but all of the operating systems on, on them had moved to um, Gaithersburg to join a benchmarking group. So there were two sides to that organization, one doing the benchmarks and one doing um, field technical support. And I wasn't able to find out an opening in the technical support organization at first. So I, I did manage to uh, get a uh, position in the benchmarking group. So I spent six years doing large systems benchmarks on relatively new hardware. That is, the system center would get a machine in before it was available to customers, and we'd start doing benchmarks on it. Um, I, I do remember the one time when the machine we were running on went belly up after about an hour, and I went over to the desk to report that and get the CEO to look at it. And he just looked at me and he said, how long have you been running? And I said, about an hour. He said, you're lucky you got that far. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really, I mean, there were a lot of, it was a really early machine. But anyway. Um, <laughs> I did finally uh, uh, get the opportunity to move over to the field technical support uh, organization where among the things we did were work with the uh, development to uh, on early support programs. Um, and Christina and I worked together to uh, on, the, on the technical agendas for many uh, IBM internal um, events. Um, we did the BM attendance, and also then we started doing uh, external events for customers as well. Um, I became a, a, a uh, rep to share. I uh, started out as the lead rep for the BM systems management project. And uh, the projects are the lowest level organization in share that they were at that time. Um, but at, uh, at one point, I, I moved up to be the lead IBM rep to the BM group organization and uh, stayed there until I retired in 2008. After retirement, I uh, moved on to something else and uh, had an opportunity to become president of a small nonprofit organization that puts on folk music concerts in the Washington, D.C. area. So that takes up most of my time now, and then the rest of it, um, I do work with the committee to help put on these um, events every year. Thanks, Jeff. Romney. Hi, Romney White. Um, <clears throat> my first job out of uh, university was at that university, University of Waterloo, where I uh, worked on MBS for a while. Um, but. Um, one day, this uh, 370 145 showed up in our machine room. Somebody decided we needed one. And this guy from IBM Canada, Paul Cardiff, came up and said, mind if I borrow your machine for a while? I said, sure. So <clears throat> we went about our business, and he went about his. And eventually, he left, and we had a stack of, of console paper, maybe a quarter of an inch thick that was the result of what he'd done. We just left, we had this console, so we started looking at it, and um, <clears throat> somehow got sucked into trying to figure out what was going on here, and next thing we knew, we're running DM. This was PLC, release one PLC5 and DM370, so we beat you by a couple of months, Gabe. <laughs> um, so that, and that was in 1972, and, um, in one way or another, I've been doing VM ever since. Thanks. So, um, one of the things we, we probably should have mentioned earlier is on some of the name tags, there's a teddy bear in a knight suit or armor, right? So there is something called the Companions of the 
order, order the companions of the Knights of Vienna. I'm probably messed up that title. Um, and I'm privileged to have four knights next to me here. Uh, Sir Mark, the Sespari guy. Do you want to tell what's the story behind that name? Yeah. I mean, relatively, let's be clear, I'm humbled and a fraud to be on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> but, I mean, really, I'm, I just, I went to, I, I talked about it the other day, I went to loads of share conferences, both as a user and as an IBMer, and ended up as the Share Europe rep for the VM project. And at one point, we had some service that we had to apply for an IBM conference, an IBM education system, uh, class. We had some service we had to apply, and it wouldn't work. We could not get the service to apply without the service. We couldn't use the features on the on this brand new machine, and we were screwed. So I spent four days debugging the execs and trying to work out what was in the OCO modules and how they work by changing the parameters, running it through, writing down what happened, and, and the end result was documenting it, putting it in a red book, and, you know, object code only and the service of object code only modules was at that time, which would have been 92, maybe, 91, 92, somewhere around that time. It was the single most important topic going on for, you know, for those of you that don't really know, there was no software business at all until about 1985. Software was mostly bundled and shipped on machines. In, in 1985, the US federal government basically passed an antitrust regulation which said you know you must unbundle all your software and of course by unbundling it that meant that you should be able to sell it 85 or 75? 75. 75 yeah by 75 so basically they created the u.s government created the environment for the software industry in 1975 and they started having to unbundle things. So VM became chargeable, uh, MVS became chargeable, lots of things became chargeable. And because it was chargeable, people needed ways to patent it. So software patents, when I was a kid, and I guess we're probably all you know, similar age, you know, when I was a kid, software patents didn't exist, right? They were too expensive, they took too long. And, and so the way to protect your software was to take away the source code. You know, um, I, was, I was party to one of the big PC source code, object code fights. Um, one of the programmers that worked for me when I was at Chemical Bank was a guy called uh, Tom, T-H-O-M, Henderson. Tom wrote the original ARC software for us to move code between a Series 1, a mainframe, a, a VAX, a DEC VAX machine, and to do it without changing the character code, the character sets, and so we could move binary data backwards and forwards. And Tom proudly open sourced his, uh, open -sourced his, um, his software, his ARC software, it was taken by a guy called Phil Katz, and Phil Katz rewrote it in assembler and called it PK Arc. This was all around 1985. And Tom had got copyright to it, and he sued, and that's where PK Zip and all its follow-ons came from. The only thing he could copyright was the name. Right, so the ARC name you couldn't use. And Phil Katz lost so much money over this, he got sued for damages. Phil Katz, um, it's all fairly accurately documented on Wikipedia. Phil Katz um, came to an early demise. So it wasn't just IBM that was doing this, the whole industry by 85 was in turmoil. 
And you know, a few years later, IBM started producing regular releases that didn't have source code for key parts. So I spent a four-day weekend in Brussels in the International Education Center, completely worked out what one of these modules was doing by changing the input one byte at a time, tracing the modules. I put it all in a red book. I wrote some code to wrap around it. And when I turned up at Share that year, uh, it would have been, I guess, the spring of the spring of 91 or 92, I, instead of bringing handouts, I bought 400 red books. And we pushed through to get the red books with a diskette, so you didn't have to type the damn Rex execs in again. And that was it. And after that, everyone was so pleased that I managed to break down what the modules, the service modules were doing, and to actually describe them, because we didn't even have, some of the modules were completely undocumented. And it caused a, it didn't cause a change of strategy, but it, it changed the way the development team that were doing the service tools worked. They hired a bright new young guy, for those of you that met him, Alex Feinberg. They hired this young guy called Alex Feinberg, who was just, he was brilliant. He was both a good programmer and a really good guy to be around. And I was lucky, that's what I got out of it. I'm Mark's uh, the Says Fari guy. Um, I just two things. Um, my wife did the title slide for my presentation because <laughs> we still were doing overheads right yeah. you know, so my wife actually hand drew that and then when we did Eric Amron myself and a few others in Europe we ran two VM master classes in Europe my wife did all the artwork for the teddy bears so thank you to my uh, my wife Wendy for that because I know some of that stuff certainly the teddy bear that uh, shows up every now and again so that's it that's the story right. <laughs> So, so Alex Feinberg, I did connect with him not too long ago. He passed on his regards to, to all you. Um, still fondly remembers parts of the VMA experience. <laughs> um, just a brief segue. Uh, up in the uh, committee room and the museum there, there's a lot of buttons. Uh, not all of those buttons, actually, a few of them were made by IBM. So some of them are ways for the customers to voice their opinion on things. <laughs> And so there's a number of buttons that talk about says um, and different opinions of it. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, it was it was really it was a really important issue. I mean, it really was. And for whatever reason, you know, the whole OCO thing, IBM executives, and then obviously the managers that reported to those executives were on strict instructions that this is how they're going to protect their secrets. But the key thing to remember is while I worked at Chemical Bank and we did what we did with one of my managers, we did the New York Amateur Computer Club original PC SIG blue download system, that sharing code and stuff was great. It was really that the government had forced this nascent software business into existence and opened it up for companies like VM software to actually sell stuff because before that it was like you had to do a really good job to convince someone to sell something that IBM was giving you for free. So that was it. You know, the whole software patents thing, I just, I still don't have my name on a patent. I have careful notes for uh, over 30 patents which I can invalidate at any time <laughs> because they, you have to declare everyone that was involved in the writing of the patent. Um, so that was my biggest achievement, I think, at IBM, was making distinguished engineer with no patents. <laughs> I just used to shrug my shoulders and tell other people, it's fine, just put your name on it, it's fine. So, so Gabe, you are sort of Gabriel the firebrand. Do you want to have any comments on <laughs> sure. Mark, Mark is a wonderful lead-in to that, because talking about OCO, by the time IBM was getting serious about OCO, I was working at a software vendor. And some of the products that we sold, vSnap and vSafe specifically, uh, safe intercepted VM ends back when VM ended, and vSafe took a snap dump. 
And if you worked on them together, if you installed them together, uh, your system wouldn't crash and it would take a dump that would make IBM happy. And the idea of source code going away would have made it impossible for these products to work. And so I was pretty energetic uh, about being unhappy about OCO and wrote letters and wrote articles in trade magazines and trade newspapers. Um, my company, VM Systems Group, was active in the trade association, ADAPSO, and I got to go to Brussels with a delegation to try to convince the common market that they should get active in fighting OCO. And it was a wonderful trip to Brussels. That's a great city. And some of the people on the delegation flew in the night before the meeting, went to the meeting, and left that evening. I said, if I'm going to Brussels, I'm going to have a lot more fun in Brussels than just sitting in a conference room. And so I spent three or four days uh, in, in, in the city having a great time. And we went to the meeting, and then uh, they didn't do it. They didn't join the fight. Um, as an IBM shareholder, as a former IBMer, I had some stock. And, so, and I'd been reading annual reports and reading shareholder meeting notices. And so with a lawyer, I wrote a letter to IBM saying, here is a motion that I want to be proposed at the shareholders meeting about OCO. And a while later, um, I got a copy of a letter, that IBM, a four or five page letter that IBM had sent to the Securities and Exchange Commission explaining to them why this was not an appropriate motion for the shareholders meeting. And so it didn't appear on the agenda for the meeting. I went to the meeting. I forget where the meeting was. I think, I think it was in Texas. And after some of the boilerplate blather that they go through, uh, people were invited to come up to microphones. And so I had what I was going to say ready, and I went up to my microphone. But I think it was John Akers, who was then the chairman of the board. And fortunately for me, he called on one of the other microphones first. And if you're at an IBM shareholders meeting and you are asking a question that they don't want to hear, the best warm-up act for you, the best question that could precede you, is somebody talking about unionizing IBM. <laughs> <laughs> and so Mr. Akers was polite but negative about unionization, and then he called on me. And what was interesting was that he had clearly been prepared for the question. My having sent in the letter about the motion that I wanted clearly prepared him for the issue. And so he had just more of the usual IBM happy talk about how it would be wonderful and they wouldn't withdraw source code as long as you still needed it. And he talked about exits and customization and lots of words that I suspect he had never heard before that meeting, before he was prepped for the meeting. And then I think I chatted with him after, and he was still being very gracious and very positive. And of course, it was all didn't mean anything. Um, oh, what I left out was after I got that response from IBM that they sent to the Securities and Exchange Commission, I went to the lawyer that I had been working with, who had been my personal lawyer, and said, what do we do now? He said, we don't do anything now, because if they responded with that letter to the SEC, you can't afford to continue doing this. I mean, their lawyers can easily beat up any lawyer you're likely to find. And so that was, that was the end of the issue. And so that was, um, that was my exposure to OCO, and just go figure, uh, that was why I was anointed Sir Gabriel of Firebrand. <laughs> Chuck, you are Sir Chuck the Imperturbable. <laughs> <laughs> to, to tell you the truth, I have no idea. Um, perhaps some of you who have worked with me may understand that a little bit more than I do. Um, but I think I can give an example, um, and, and this sequence has worked out perfectly. Um, another thing that Gabe left out was that um, Probably at my first or second share, he gave a presentation uh, for the VM Systems Management um, Project on the issue of OCO. 
I have it here if anyone wants to look at it. <laughs> I did not want to look at it. <laughs> um, and and I, I was, it was my project, and I was in the audience, and, um, and I listened to everything that Gabe had to say, and it all made sense. And one thing that I didn't pay attention to that I guess I should have was that there were some comments in Gabe's presentation about um, having the folks contact their IBMers and, or IBM management, I guess, and, and, uh, and, and make their case for doing away with OCO. And about three days or so after the meeting finished, I got a call from Charlie Lyman, who was the lead IBM rep to share. He says, did you hear what Gabe said? And I said, well, yeah. Said, you didn't think to tell anybody about it? <laughs> and I said, well, no, I didn't. And and so I just let it let it go with that. And uh, and, and I I guess I sort of thought that if, after Gabe had done all of the other things, that IBM management would have expected something like that, and that I didn't need to tell them. So maybe that explains a little bit about it. <laughs> I like that story. I've always. Um, you're so even keel, Chuck. Even though I've seen scenarios where, why isn't he upset? Um, so I'm sure there's a lot more. You, you haven't seen the right situation. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's early. <laughs> and Romney, you are, you have no title. Yeah. You were one of the original ones. Yes, yeah, so, so the order of the Knights of the M was the brainchild of, of my friend and colleague at uh, Waterloo, uh, Jacques Mion, he was a Frenchman who, uh, his sister lived in Quebec. And, oh, I meant to, when I started, I meant to echo Mark's remarks. I'm Canadian, uh, I'm from Canada, and I am still Canadian. <laughs> I've been here for more than half my life. Um, anyway, so, so Jacques came to work at, at Waterloo. Um, he was really, uh, he was really a hasp guy. But uh, somehow we became friends and he got involved in, in the end. So we're at Share, and he, unbeknownst to me or anybody else, decides he's going to start the order of the Knights of the End. He picks, I don't know, how many, eight or nine people. Uh, I think it was in Denver, maybe. Um, he, they, and in these days, right, Share was a huge event. They had these. Big round tables. So Jacques made all of us get up on this table and he inducted us into the order of the Knights of VM. Um, but he didn't, didn't have the um, background in heraldry that, uh, that Melinda brought to the party. And, and you know, it soon became a much, uh, much more formal process. But uh, yeah, we. We were just uh, in the right place at the right time and in Jack's good graces. Awesome. So, so uh, Bill, what's your title? Uh, I am Sir Bit the Performer. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are. And here I am. <laughs> I am <a> Still here. <laughs> I feel a bit like a game show host. <laughs> well, as long as this isn't the price is right, otherwise I have to go up there and run down. <laughs> Maybe later. Um, so, uh, I was disappointed. Um, at one time, we were hoping there'd be yet another chair up here with somebody in, uh, Mike Cowshaw, uh, who, for various reasons, wasn't able to make the trip over, just logistics and so forth. Um, I believe most, if not all, of you have interacted with Mike, uh, the inventor of Rex, for, for those that weren't aware. Um, is there a, a, a short story interaction with him that you want to share? So we can kind of include him in here, even though he's not here. Um, sure. Uh, one of the, the, the fun things that I got to do right at the end of my time at the small software company was to co-edit with Phil Smith three McGraw-Hill technology books. The first of, and we had a choice of title. I mean, they basically said, whatever you want, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take it. And so Phil and I did the Rex handbook. And Mike was very helpful, very supportive. Uh, 
uh, Phil and I followed the Tom Sawyer approach to getting anything done. He and I signed the contract with McGraw Hill. There you go. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring it. I thought it was. Oh, I thought I could. So yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, the, the, way we, the way we did the book was after we signed the contract promising to McGraw Hill that we do each of these books, we recruited 50 or 75 authors to actually write the chapters. And so, of course, M Mike wrote one or two chapters for the Rex Handbook, and he arranged for Sir John Faircliffe, who had been the lab manager at Hursley when Mike developed Rex. And so that was that was the interaction with Mike. And one of one of the things that I discovered with writing something, especially something as, as hefty as a, as, as, a, as a book like that, you can you can count on as soon as the first copy of the book arrives, you will hold it and cherish it and open it. And then no matter how many people have read the manuscript for you, there will be something that smacks you in the face. And in the case of the Rex handbook, it was a mistake that Phil and I had introduced into the foreword by Sir John Faircliffe. So talking about heraldry and royalty, uh, we screwed up something that he had graciously written for us, but he and Mike continued to be gracious and did not hold that against us. But Mike was a very, very helpful in helping us structure the book, and all three of the books, one was the Rex book, the other, the other two were VMASA books, right, when VMASA was coming out. And the, all of the authors, about half of them, were IBMers. And so Mike was, was very helpful in recruiting people within IBM who had had anything to do with Rex, and he was tremendously helpful in making that book a success. I, I have two stories, but I think I'll just do one of them right now, and we'll see how things go. Um, this not only involves Mike, but it involves my son. Um, several years ago, my son started working in the same organization that, that I am. And his job was to make sure that all of those technical giants could work with their PCs and their think pads, and he kept them up to date and, and that sort of thing. And, and this was in the, in the really day, early days of our using Lotus Notes. And part of my responsibility was, as I said before, lining up speakers to talk at um, technical conference and, and stuff like that. And um, I was trying to send Mike a note with information about the con conference that he was we'd invited him to speak at. And I could not get Lotus Notes to send that note to Mike. And so I get so frustrated, I picked up my laptop and I went over to the next hallway and I went into my son's office and I set it down on his desk and I said, fix this. And he looked at the note, and he looked at me and he said, you know Mike Kolachov? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, yes I do. And I explained all of what I just explained to you. And then I, and he started to explain to me that he had written some PC code that was in one of these IBM repositories, um, and IBM was doing away with those. And it turned out it was something that Mike depended on. And so he had sent a note to my son, making sure that, you know, that that software was going to stay around for a while, and he kind of assured him that it was. And I looked at it and I said, you know Mike Polish? <laughs> <laughs> so there's one more part of that story, and, and, and this is that um, sometime after that, um, Mike came to give a presentation at Hillgang. And he kind of, you know, before his presentation, sat in the back row, and, and uh, I grabbed a seat next to him, and at a, at a break, I, I kind of just went through what I just told you about the conversation. And he looked at me, and he said, what was your son's name? And I said, Ken Morris. And he dug through his email until, his, until he found that correspondence with my son. And he gave me a demo of what it was my son had provided to him. And, uh, <laughs> That was something I had not expected. So, uh, uh, Mike and I uh, shared a uh, fondness for an appreciation for wine, mm -hmm. and uh, which meant at any opportunity, uh, we were in the same city, 
we would find an opportunity to have dinner together. And uh, I can remember many of these, but one in particular was a restaurant in uh, Anaheim where Cher was held uh, many times, uh, called Mr. Stotts. The restaurant has since closed. I know that because I tried to go there the last time I was in Anaheim and was sadly disappointed. But was there one night with Mike and a bunch of people, and uh, we decided after dinner we should have a little more wine. So I took the wine list and I ordered a bottle of Pinot Noir. It arrived. We enjoyed it, but Mike was was not really thrilled with my selection. So he asked for the wine list, and he ordered a bottle of wine and a Pinot Noir, and they served it to us. And we all took a taste, and he said, there, that's what a Pinot Noir is supposed to taste like. <laughs> Mike aimed his son after me. Is this Fari guy? No. <laughs> Mike named his son after me. His son's name is Mark Cowlish, or... Um, that's what I think, and I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> Mike, I mean, so I, I've been one of these, because I, you know, I, like, I had a great admiration for Romney long before he had joined IBM and, um, and before I met him in person. I knew him from Timeshare and VM Share and, and his work there. Um, the same for Gabe and Chuck. Um, I met Mike in probably 77, 76 maybe, before he'd done Rex, when he was first starting on it. Um, and in my career, because I, because I don't have a classical computer education career, I have no degree, I never went to college, I have always been attracted to people that really know what they're talking about. And I know, because I often don't know what I'm talking about, I know the difference. <laughs> I can tell a bullshitter at 50 feet. <laughs> so I, Mike was my first, uh, we, we have a sports um, therapy, sports recovery business now, and um, it's, it's my wife's business. Um, but the, one of the terms that's used in the sports field a lot, which I really dislike, is a goat, right? You have these people that are out there in front that are leading things. And Mike was truly my first goat. And literally anything that Mike did, I was going to get on. You know, I was going to find some way to be of help to Mike. And we did, we did Oak, which became Java, and after Rex, I, I was nothing to do with Rex until uh, until I, I managed to get an early copy at Chemical Bank in New York in 81, 82, no, it, sorry, in 83. Um, and then when, you know, Mike told me about the, the Rex compiler, I was like all over that. I think that's what I wrote about for your book, the Rex handbook. I think I wrote about the Rex compiler. I worked with the guys in the Vienna lab. Um, and then, Object Rex, and Java, and NetRex, and all, I had something to do with all of those things, but nothing to do with the code. You know, because Mike was, Mike was just, he was the exact opposite of me. He was quiet, he was confident, he was, he was professional, he was brilliant, you know. And so I just like, I'm like, this is my guy. I'm going to take my leads from him. And there have been others in my career, but Mike was Mike was truly the first brilliant guy that I had the fortune, good fortune to work with. Thank you. So, so Mike, if you're listening to this, I'm surprised. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, we wish you could be here. We understand, and, and uh, thank you for all you've done. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to open it up to questions to the audience. So raise your hand, and, and I'll try to see you. Some hands I might not be able to see. So any questions, uh, you can ask them for all of the panelists, or if you want to single one out, um, that's welcome to. Where do you go? Uh, Jim? Or is it an open question for any of you? 
So the question was, in VM, if there's one thing you could change, what would it be and why? Well, if there's something I don't like, I'd change it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Uh, you want me to close my ears? <laughs> I'm just trying to decide which oh, yeah. you know, like a handful of things. <laughs> I, I guess if I could change one thing, I would go back and help it remain a vibrant production quality system. Because the time that I spent at MITRE, we ran props, then we ran Office Vision, and we went through a succession of IBM processors from a 145 to a 148 to a 4341 connected to a 4381 with the first instance of SSI from, from Romney decades ago, um, and it was productive. And it, did, it, did, it was personal computing decades before uh, the term personal computing was, was released. Um, it let people form communities within the company, it let people be productive, it let people be innovative, it let people be independent of central IT back before that was very common. Um, and I just think it's tragic that VM has been, I'll, I'll say relegated, and that's a little bit too strong a word, relegated to a support for running Linux on mainframes. But VM should have been a contender. And there are probably many reasons it wasn't, <clears throat> including politics and including OCO. So I have one that almost no one in this building probably even Romney doesn't even know about. Um, I mean, amongst the many things I worked on when I got into corporate strategy, back around 2002, we were doing the Globus Grid computing. Anyone remember Globus Grid and all that stuff? And it was right before Amazon and Google um, started opening up their data centers for basically what we know now as cloud computing. And I think, you know, when I look back at it, and I've still got the, I, I said to Bill, I had really meant to scan it in, but now I know there's such a great community out here, I'll put some silent aside. I still have the 400 plus page 3800 printer continuous forms version of VMXC, the high level design for VMXC. It came way before uh, VMXA. Uh, it was basically an out, it was basically a project that was built off of the CERN. Um, th th there was a massive CERN uh, computing system to deal with the data from the Super Collider at CERN, and Dick Newson, who was one of the original VMXA, uh, VM uh, managers, development managers, and a, and a bunch of us in Europe wrote this thing. I didn't write it, I mean, I, but you know, we were reviewing and asking questions and stuff, and I've still got in my, in my sort of personal archive down in the mechanical room in the basement, I've still got like this huge thing and on it is written VMXC spec, do not destroy. <laughs> and it's just, so I, I need to get that. I would have loved for somehow that to have got incorporated into the VM product because when we were still struggling to do four and eight way support, it was 32 way out the door, it was designed for a 164-way computer system. So it's 164 separate computers. So I think if we could have done that in CP and built the management around it, I think, you know, the, the, the um, grid environment as we know it today would almost certainly still be on x86, but we could have shaped the way that it happened, instead of it all being random discovery and reinvention, 
the, the, a VM product. And who knows, maybe IBM would have done something, but it got completely killed, never made it out of what was known as the French system center, the French field system center. But it was, uh, it was done from one, for the, uh, the CERN Super Collider project. It was just brilliant. And it was all so simple, we thought. So that would be mine. Have you heard it at the VM workshop? Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Comment first to Dave. I have a pin still that says VM is a client server when client server wasn't cool. Because we were, you know, really. Uh, my question is more general to the audience. How many VM nights are here? Because there's got to be a lot of us here at this point. So the question was how many VM nights are here? If you're a VM Knight, could you raise your hand? Oh, wow. <laughs> well over half the room. Yeah, so I, I, I think if I recall when I looked through the list, there were, uh, 40. I think there were 40 that, that were signed up. Uh, e either between here or that are also coming tonight. Great. Great. Uh, other questions in the audience? This isn't a question, but since you made a comment about OCO, I was playing at my, my home, and I found this roll it's addressed to Jeff Savage. Mm. From Gabe Goldberg. <laughs> from 1985. And, oh, yeah. I used to have them. You have these. These are the VM, I don't know what. what is his name? Bruce? Someone or another? That's right. The OCO Ostrich, uh, this, it's the VM Systems Group posters. Yeah. I, I just found these again, because I, I used to have Jeff's office in Merrill, and when I cleaned out, when I left, I took the, I emptied it and ended up in my basement. So luckily I didn't wow. get washed out in one of the floods, but, you know. Sure. I'm to let Jeff know that you were here with all those things I, uh, I, have, I actually told him that I had them oh, okay. years ago, but um, <laughs> this is a, a small so The tool basics, yeah. BMXASP, and the OCO is loco. <laughs> <laughs> And we, we had we had a fun marketing vice president, and she was the one that originated VBear. So let me ask the audience: How many people still have their VBear from VMSG? Excellent. I've got one. I've got the, the Wave poster still from VM Software. I think I've still got that. Thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, so, so thanks, Phil. There's also posters up in the museum there, a few uh, good ones. Uh, we keep looking for these things that, that, that pop up. Uh, so as you clean out basements... Um, <laughs> 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 you can't find Jacob, you can send them to me. Okay. Or Jacob will also take them. Um, but, but we want to collect that, that, that stuff as best we can. Um, I'm scared to go in Mark's basement, though. <laughs> Uh, other questions? Phil, you should plug the museum. If you haven't gone to see what all's up there, there's a bunch of fun memorabilia. Fun. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rick. And also, um, there's a couple chairs up there with signs that say, take me. Not the chairs, but <laughs> things and stuff that are there, extras. Some of you might want that. So even if you didn't live in that era, you might want to see that. Um, there's, there's a number of OCO buttons. There's also some more adult buttons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of opinions being expressed, we just say it's Or yet the VM Glasgow button. That I believe that's up there. Um, maybe one of these events will do a slide per button and tell the stories behind some of these. Sort of like you got to share on the chair. All right. Other questions, comments? Artie. Oh, Artie. I have the opposite question to James's. I'm um, guessing for three of those, where you think, but uh, what function do you like to see added to VM? So, what function would you most like to see added to VM? In general terms. In general terms. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'll, I'll do the. Well, I'll, I actually, uh, I actually am uh, thinking about what my next project will be. So I don't really have uh, haven't settled on one yet. Something that I I think uh, is important to the BM to the health of BM in the future, though, is improvements in memory management, in particular. Uh, memory posts that are thinking that support for a large page uh, would be would be a good thing to do. That would let us support lots more central storage in a single, single partition. But I don't think I'm going to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need Len Wheeler. We'll work right there. I'm completely unqualified. I mean, I sat in, I sat in some really good sessions over the last two days, and sat there going, "What are they talking?" About? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like as in, I literally don't understand this anymore. You know, LPAS seems to have changed so much. Linux management's changed so much. IO, so. Ready for some lightning round? So I'll give you a word or phrase. You each give me like the first thing. The first thing that you can say out loud that comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. One more. Okay. Yep. Uh, how do you how do you keep a passion for a product? So the question. Thirty seconds. The question was how do you keep a passion for a product for as long as you have? The community. Uh, well, having having you really started. <laughs> I, I didn't hear that. That's all right. Having, having, having started in 1972, uh, I got to watch local VM user groups start all over the country, in fact, all over the world. And when I got to VMSG in 1985, uh, I was on the road talking to all of the user groups. And there was Hillgang in DC and MVMUA in New York and NEUVM uh, in New England and Cavemen in Bunch. Chicago and Bay Bunch, and there were probably 20 or more uh, local user groups, all of which served as evangelists for VM. And spending my time, and I was very involved in Share, uh, and that was a wonderful community. And VM Share started in 1975 by the people at TimeNet, that served as the glue to hold the worldwide VM community together in between share meetings. And so we all got to know each other. And for a while, it was a lot of fun because you'd go to share and you'd meet somebody that you, you had known online for several years. And you'd finally have a face and a person to, to put it together with. And I've made so many friends in the VM community that it's hardly a challenge to maintain the passion. And doing the books, the, the three books, the Rex and the two VMESA books, uh, led me to meet lots more VMers, people interested in Rex and VM. Um, and so that's just been a tremendous part of my career and of my personal life. And as I said at the beginning, uh, I owe a debt of gratitude to whoever it was at Meijer that decided we should put in VM370 because I hes hesitate to think about what life would have been had I gone from OS 360 to MVS and to uh, ZOS now, and I would certainly not be here in this room with this great bunch of people. So I, I take what Gabe said and actually turn it on its head. Um, I would say whatever you do in life, whatever you do, like I have, I have so many things I've worked on, you know, because I am literally a master of jack of all trades and master of none. All the best things I've worked on were with teams and communities. If you can get to work in a team, and it doesn't come easy, right? Because it means often it means taking what you want to achieve and either trying to get them as a team to achieve it with you or to just give up on what you want to achieve and work towards the team's goals. If you can work with a good team at any time, doing almost anything, 
it is easy to be passionate about it, right? You can get up in the morning and think, I'm gonna go do this for someone, right? And, and a lot of that, we were lucky, you know, at our generation, um, because VM was so fertile as a product and changing so rapidly, we were lucky that we all had reasons to meet all the time. We had reasons to keep in touch. We were exchanging software all the time. The, you know, back in the days when you, know, you would get excited because your latest copy of the VM Tools tape was coming, right? Hartman right. used to get, John Hartman who wrote CMS Pipelines, John Hartman used to get the Tools tapes from the US as a freaking tape, he had someone send them to him in Denmark. John worked in the European Software Distribution Center. He worked some deal to magically send out these tapes using <laughs> IBM. It was all, it was all, you know, non-IBM software, but it was source code, Artie's Rex sockets, which I couldn't. I, I remember he did something really important. I just didn't remember what. And I didn't even realize it was on the agenda for tomorrow morning, so I'll be sitting up the bank salivating, Artie. But we would get this stuff on tapes from, you know, as users, not that this was before I worked for IBM, we would get this stuff from time. It was a real community, but what I learned was the same thing is, no matter how you personally feel about mixing with other people, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of socially awkward, you know, I, I go to parties. No, really. I, I go to, it's because I'm, I'm with a team here, right? I'm with friends. I go to a party, I'm the guy that picks up a drink and goes and stands in the corner just the way the rest of you, you know, well, not the rest of you, but some of you, some of you will undoubtedly be the same, right? But when you're in a team where you've got shared goals and shared objectives and, and things to achieve as a team, it is just the best thing, and you can apply that to almost anything you do in life. I guess uh, for me, it, it's the, uh, I mean, the community was certainly an important part. Uh, but also, the VM was a very, is a very fertile area of problems and solutions. And uh, virtualization is like magic, and you know I can't do magic, but I can pretend I can when I work on virtualization. You make something seem something, you know, that looks like one thing, behave like something else, and you do something something good for for customers and persons. I I would agree with Gabe that you know almost everything that that I did as a member of the Washington System Center involved working with um, dedicated customers and IT members, and, and that was what kept me going. So I think it's clear from a lot of the comments and discussions here, you know, the community, the, the technology, and the blend of those two things you know, really make things special to you. Um, I'm gonna spare these guys the lightning rounds. <laughs> Um, but I want to give them each uh, uh, a little bit of time to share one last thought. Um, so, anybody ready for the last thoughts? All right, I'm ready. All right. <laughs> I, uh, I knew he was going to do that, and I spent some time trying to think of a number of things that had happened in my career that I wanted to mention. Um, and last night I decided I wanted to mention something that happened in the VM lab yesterday afternoon. <laughs> um, I was helping Richard with the lab, and it was a, a, a young guy working on the VM installation. And he called me over, and he showed me Richard's, you know, the page he was looking at in, in Richard's workbook. And, and he pointed to something, and he said, what does that mean? What he was pointing at was a four-letter acronym, all capital letters, D A S D. <laughs> but you laugh, but it wasn't funny. It was wonderful. Okay? Because we had something.
nobody in the lab who knew nothing about mainframes and was grabbing onto it as, as hard as he could. And so I think what we need to do is go find more people that don't know what those four letters mean and get them out here for the next workshop. I'm going to ask you your IBM. Yeah. Good IBM term. Yep. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll chime in to, to doubly thank Mark because the reason I'm here was that a month or so ago, Mark and I were exchanging email. And I hadn't planning, been planning to come to the workshop. And something that Mark said, or something that I said to Mark, let me say, hey, I should go to the workshop. And so it was before the price went up, and so I signed up and paid my $100. And the other thing is that Mark recruited me for the panel. And so coming here was fun, and being on the panel was fun. So thank you twice. I, um, my final thought is, you know, there are, and I am going to get emotional, there are so many people in this room that I owe my success to. So many IBMers and so many customers. So, you know, my final thought is thank you. You know, it really is. It's just thank you. You know, Bob Rogers, I never knew Bob worked for VM development now. <laughs> Bob and I used to we used to battle over sessions together. We worked on the design council together. You know, thank you, Bob. Um, Jim Perel, is Jim still here? Yeah, Jim's up the back. You know, the, a lot of the client server strategy that we did at, at IBM for the mainframe was really a lot of Jim's work up front. Um, I mentioned RT, Andrea and Romney you know, before they were before they were together. I, I, you know, all the people at Share at Bill Bittner and Damien, we haven't had a chance to talk, but you know, Damien, Chris Casey up the back, um, Pam Christina, Eric Amron was was one of my long time, you know, really helpful people, you know, dealing with Germany and Berlin and there are so many of you, um, you know, Mark, um, there's so many of you in this room. You know, I was a kid with no particular education, and you guys made it possible for me to do something with my life. So, you know, thank you all. That's a tough act. <laughs> <laughs> that's always my that's always my mission. Yeah. Right? That's always my mission. Um, well, I want to thank Bill for uh, putting this together. Uh, I think uh, is I, I can understand. Uh, when he thought it was part of his job in IBM to work with the folks who put on the workshop and work with all of you. But uh, I think this, his devotion to this group really uh, is emblematic of what uh, what the community is and, and what it can continue to be with all the support of everybody here. So, how's it go, Bill? Ever onward? Ever onward. <laughs> <laughs>